Good day, everyone. I'm Dr. Abraham Weisfeld, and uh, we are here to do an interview with uh, Comrade Net on the uh, status of Buddhism, its conceptions and its implementation. Now, um, I'm a, an academic, but a, a non-professional academic. I'm not uh, teaching in university because I'm boycotted for having written a thesis against the nation state, which is the epitome of liberalism and liberalism is the epitome of all political science departments in Canada, except for in part, the University of Quebec Montreal here in Montreal, which is where I completed my doctoral thesis uh, on Bundism and a, and a critique of the nation state. I am speaking as the chairman of the uh, United International Intercommunalist Convergence, which is the merging of various tendencies that have a common uh, methodological approach in terms of constitutional theory. So we accept you know, that there are going to be various autonomous social formations in a federated society without a state. So this allows us to work together with uh, Bundes, anarchists, and Maoists. Uh, in terms of uh, you know, uh, national liberation struggles, as epitomized by the um, Maoist uh, political theory that has been rather successful. In terms of it being a, uh, you know, uh, an extrapolation of the uh, permanent revolution thesis in which uh, the third world actually becomes the vanguard of the international revolution and not its tail as prescribed, you know, in, in previous theories, in particular by, by the um, Trotsky's theory of permanent revolution, otherwise known as Bronstein. So, I would like to introduce you to Comrade Net, who I've known for many years now, 10 or so years. We've worked together. And uh, Comrade Net has had a uh, significant influence on my own political development. And I credit Comrade Net with having explained to me the uh, profound nature of the theory of third worldism, which I had not grasped previously. And I had only sort of been educated to the extent of the uh, Trotskyist permanent revolution, but not realizing the uh, basic nature, profoundly basic nature of third worldism and its uh, league enrolled in the world revolution. In addition, I'd like to uh, point out that Comrade Net is, uh, is a political activist and uh, is in not only a engaged in uh, developing political theory on his own and with others, but is, um, but is also uh, an organizer, a political organizer. And they all fit together, political theorist, political organizer, and political activist. And uh, that is uh, how I would describe a comrade net to you. I would in invite uh, comrade net to introduce himself now and to uh, um, make a mention of uh, the comrades as well. Um, yes, I I'm Comrade Net, um, the cleric of public relations for the United Intercommunalist Convergence or uh, United International uh, Intercommunalist Convergence, also known as the Revolutionary <laughs> Intercommunalist Convergence. Um, I, uh, as you said, I've known you for a, a, a long time now, and you too have had. Uh, quite an impact uh, on me. Um, in fact, you were the one that got me into black bloc activism. Mm. I was very wary of it before that, before you explained it. Like, I think you misunderstand what this is. Yeah, but, uh, that's been very significant. And the tactics of what I call non-aggression over that of non-violence, I learned from you as well. Yeah. yeah. Let's make a mention of the uh, the martyrs' names uh, to record them for memory, and then we will uh, begin uh, with a series of questions. Okay. Um, um, Marvin Eliyahu, and he was the uh, he was the councilman of uh, World Forums. Uri Adia, he was the councilman of National Affairs. Hannah Tuff was the 
uh, Councilwoman of Strategic Projects. Isaiah P. Comenstein was the councilman of committees. Uh, he was also a reconstructionist rabbi, although he wasn't uh, the he wasn't the the one reading leading the religious office within the organization. Um, but he was very insightful. And then there's Miriam Emmisberg, uh, very interesting. Uh, she practiced a lot of traditional positions, and yet she was an atheist. And it was when she was an atheist that she started wearing the veil and stuff like that, um, because you know, um, she had a lot to do with uh, the rejection, the further rejection of secularism in favor of an alternative to secularism. Um, as a Jewish atheist, she felt secularism did not um, fit her the needs. Um, she was the councilwoman of education, and she was probably the best out of all of us in a historical context. She knew a lot. Uh, she knew more than Donna Newman, and Donna Newman knows quite a bit about the historical background about a lot of these things. But uh, they were taken from us, sadly, and they formed what I would call the bulk of what Buddhism is now. Um, a lot of people look at me, but like very few people know my divergence from where they're coming from, because I'm still trying to explain where they were coming from. And I tend to speak to them collectively, because that's that's how we did see ourselves was a, a collective. Hmm. Mm -hmm. So let's uh, begin to uh, do a systematic presentation of uh, what is the Demarchism. All right, well, Demarchism self-describes itself as a methodology or more accurately a group of methodologies which seek the organic socialism that is not described in either Marxism or anarchism. For this reason, it rejects the term communist, not that the concept of communism is rejected, but that the term, because communism is associate, has been associated throughout the entire communist movement through Marxists, and when it's not associated with Marxists, it's associated with anarchists. And the word gives a, a very Western taste to people, even though it largely was not successful in the West. But you know that, that's kind of what started the 9-11 movement was the dissatisfaction of the Soviet Union's Eastern Bloc and, and, and later the degeneration of China after Mao's death. So, uh, Denmarkism does largely fall back. It, it's it's kind of a continuity and rupture within the non-alignment movement. But what makes Denmarkism special is it removes any leanings towards fascism or social democracy, which has was the weakness of the non-alignment movement. If we're honest about that, yeah. how does it uh, differ from anarchism? Well, anarchism. Now there's different strands of anarchism, but I understand anarchism more or less through the commune of anarchy theory, which has been picked up by different anarchist collectives uh, since the 90s. Um, and I'm not like the expert on it, but what I've noticed that is anarchism, at least in the commune of anarchy theory, um, it, it, it believe, it want, it, the end game is direct democracy, but the government is anarchy and the economy is communism. And of course, there's all these nuances into that. But Demar and I would also say anarchism is definitely an ideology, whereas uh, demarchism is not so much an ideology as it's a, it's a set of methodologies that are united in a core uh, a philosophical principle. Um, and demarchism puts an emphasis on direct democracy, like a high emphasis, and, and uh, chastises the, the two communist camps of Marxism and anarchism for, while not rejecting direct democracy, never making that the big focal point. Hmm. So democ uh, democracy is the fundamental principle of demarchism. Yeah, and um, when Frederick Danson first came up with the concept of Denmark, Denmarkism and he built all this praxis into it, the primary things he constantly would go back to was Jehamaria and the Jewish labor boom. Um, and he was often very frustrated that you didn't see these replicated in Marxism or anarchism at all anywhere, at, at least in his time. Mm. Um, so like, yeah. Oh yeah, the Jehamaria, you know, like was... Uh was not uh, adopted, it was not accepted, you know, by the leftists of North America. It was uh, marginalized. My activities as organizer for North America of the Green Movement on behalf of the Jamaria were uh, consistently um, isolated. And, and in fact, as some of the leftist journalists who came with us on, on, a, on the voyage uh, to Tripoli and conferencing there, adopted the uh, 
the uh, strangest rumors about the Jamaria and uh, that were very prejudicial to it and uh, printed their their uh, such prejudices you know in their uh, in their reports that were published in the newspapers the various uh, magazines of uh, of Toronto and Ottawa so the role of leftists you know with respect to the Jamaria has been very limited and uh, now we are bringing it back in spite of the overthrow of the Gaddafi government, basically, what it was, and uh, nurturing the development of the revolutionary committees as in the uh, Green Movement originally, autonomous revolutionary committees, that is. Now, there is a, a certain uh, uh, lack of knowledge of uh, what Bundism is in terms of uh, Jewish political culture and Jewish uh, religion. Uh, for instance, so what is uh, Bundism's take or takes on the Messiah, for instance? What would you say about that? It says that we have only like nine minutes left for some reason. Um, well, go ahead. We'll, start, right. we'll start a part two in after that. Okay. All right, so um, Bundism's take or takes more accurately on the Messiah. Um, first of all, if you take it from the historical point of view, there's the there's the Joseph concept of Messiah and there's the Judah concept of Messiah. The Joseph concept of the Messiah survives in the Samaritans and the Judah concept leads to King David and King Solomon. Um, but then there's later development of the theory that it's uh, an age because if you take that lineage of David thing seriously, then it would be a king, a special king in, in a certain age. And there's those that just drop the king and say it's the age. And then there's also Gentile um, messiahs that have existed. If you get into what a messiah is as an anointed king, this means Malcolm X and Martin Luther King Jr. and Fred Hampton were all messiahs. Hmm. But uh, one of the differences between a Gentile messiah and a Jewish messiah is that a Jewish messiah is not supposed to get killed. This is why we know, this is one of the primary reasons why we know that Jesus wasn't the Messiah at all. So you're using the term Messiah as in a prophet? No, no, no. See, that's another thing as Messiahs typically are not prophets, although they could be. Um, a Messiah is a special anointed chosen king for a certain task. And a true Messiah can't be a monarch either. He has to be a proper king, like kings before monarchies. He has mm -hmm. to be kind of a chief or, or a sultan. Like a Samuel. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, like like Samuel was. Uh, it, it's kind of funny though, because like it didn't take long for the uh, kingdom to degenerate into monarchy and two monarchies, for that matter. Mm, yeah, that's right. Yeah, no, that was a failure, and yet it is uh, extolled uh, by the Protestants and the Zionists as being the uh, the epitome of God's will or something. Really. Yeah, it's it's it's, it's actually quite shameful because uh, like yes, theologically, uh, David and and Solomon are completely embraced but if you read the subtext there was a lot of problems which are recorded even in the scriptures about this and they seem to bypass that all the time you know like um uh here's another question uh, uh relating to the understanding of the unity and division between torah culture and the sinai religion what do you mean by that okay well that a lot of people look at the the Talmud and scriptures and say, well, that's religion. Well, okay, maybe, but that is much more of the cultural thing because, like, if you go through the Talmud, yeah, it talks about the mitzvahs uh, the, all the time, but it goes way more. I've noticed into cultural dynamics and situa everyday situations. So I would say that the Torah culture is through appeal pool, through um, the intellectual debate and study. And the idea that things are not ever really truly constantly settled while there is a fundamental basis for principle, you know, principle branches out into to like a tree of different actions, depending on where you are, and what time you are in. So that that definitely has an effect on the Torah culture, whereas the Sinai religion is a lot more about the 613 commandments. You know, um, it has much more to do with the vigor of ritual. Mm -hmm. I suggest that we take a break now and uh, start another video to do part two, because it's not just a recording that takes up the time in Zoom for the 40 minutes maximum. 
but the uh, preparations as well. So uh, we will return to you immediately. Excellent.